Hi, this is another Eurofile review, this time of Die Baumeister von Arcadia, um, the architects of Arcadia, by Rudiger Dorn. Now, the reason that I came across this game, I was always, um, or have been for some time now, quite a big fan of this game here, um, Java. Java by uh, Wolfgang Kramer, and uh, a friend of mine picked up a copy of another game in this trilogy. The, the other games here are uh, Tikal and Mexica. And I played Mexico and absolutely loved it, but I couldn't get a uh, uh, I couldn't get hold of a copy of it. So I was looking for similar games, games where you lay out a board and then you uh, lay out pieces on that board in order to score areas of territory, rather than a sort of uh, area majority or area control game in the conflicty sort of sense. So I'm not looking for a civilization game, something where spatial awareness, uh, almost like an abstract, but with a, a thin layer of theme over it. That's what I loved about Mexico and also about Java. And so Die Baumeister von Arcadia um, looked like a very similar sort of prospect. I like Rudiger Dorn's games. I enjoyed, um, what have we got here? Louis the Fourteenth. That's a, a great game. Uh, I haven't played his his real big game, Goa. But I also like this very light game, Emerald, uh, which is also by Rudiger Dorn. So I, I like the designer. Uh, I like that sort of spatial, uh, tactical, uh, abstract with the thin theme. And so I was hoping that I'd get a lot out of Arcadia. So let's have a look at how it plays. So this is the game set up as if for a midway through a three-player game. I say as if this is not, I haven't actually been playing a three-player game, so this may be slightly unrealistic in terms of the actual layout, but I wanted to lay it out enough that I could give you an idea of the basic mechanics without giving you a thorough, detailed explanation of the rules. So you'll notice that the game has these beautiful um, plastic pieces, reminiscent of the pieces in the Wolfgang Kramer game Torres. Um, so I'm talking about these castle pieces here, which are used to build up this central castle. And this has a nice commodity, sort of, well, I, I, I hesitate to say commodity, a speculation element to the game because the colors on the surface of the castle indicate the value of these various seals. So each player is going to be trying to get these little seals which represent different families in the game. And currently you can see that red is worth three coins um, per seal. So if I sold red, I'm getting quite a good deal on it, but not as good a deal as I'd get if I was to sell silver seals because they're currently worth four. Gold is worth one and black is worth two. And that's the basis of this whole game is trying to manipulate which families are showing on the surface of these castle pieces as you build up the layers of the castle and it can eventually go to three levels high. So the way that you get these seals is by building these little Tetris type pieces down here. Um, so pieces like this, which represent different buildings in the game, when you place them on the board, you do so by playing a card with that particular shape in the corner and it has a color on it. So a seal will be placed onto the building when you play the card. And, uh, and once the, the building is completely surrounded, then that seal becomes yours if you surround the building. However, you also get additional seals by placing these little worker, um, uh, these, these little um, miniatures on the board. And as they go completely surround it, depending on how many miniatures you have of your color, you're gonna get a certain amount of seals. So if I can just show you that sort of mechanic in action, let's have a look at it a little bit closer. So here we have the sort of layout that you might see in one section of the board. We've got multiple different colored workers around different buildings. Um, the different player colors in this game, orange, yellow, and green. There's also a purple player, but I've laid it out as for three players. You've also got these neutral colored workers, and any player could have some of these and place them around buildings. But if the building is surrounded, they're not gonna generate you any extra income. So they're just there to help you to surround the building. So for example, um, let's have a look at playing a card and surrounding a building. So supposing I had this card, um, this gives me a silver seal on one of these pieces here. So we're looking at a piece like this. Now I can place this anywhere on the board that is adjacent 
to other pieces orthogonally adjacent. I cannot place it diagonally adjacent. Um, and it can be adjacent either to a building or to a worker. So I could, for example, slot this in here. Okay, so if I slotted that in there, I then get to place a silver seal on it. Now this building is not currently surrounded because this space is still free, but the next player may choose to surround it. And if that player was, for example, the green player, he would place a green worker on there. The green player now claims the silver seal. He gets an additional silver seal for each of his green workers surrounding that building. So that's one, two, and so he gets two more silver seals. And if any other player has um, coloured pieces around it, then they will also score points, uh, score seals. So at the moment that doesn't happen because this is a neutral worker and this is also a neutral worker. But if we had the situation where this was instead an orange worker, then he would also gain a silver seal, even though it's not his turn. So there's lots of opportunities for tactical placement of placing your people into spots where you think other people are going to build so that you can benefit from their buildings. And then you get the opportunity to manipulate the levels on this castle by taking a castle piece from the general sort of supply over here and adding that to the castle. So if I've got uh, a lot of silvers, I'm not going to want to disrupt this silver piece down here and reduce the value of silver. So I might, for example, add a gold piece over there, which covers over a different color, um, and, and so manipulate the different prices. Now another element of the game is that each player has four of these pennants hanging on their player screen. So these things here. You can play these, these are one time only and you've got four of them. When you play them you immediately gain two new workers. It's the only way you get new workers to come back to you throughout the game. And you also get the opportunity to sell off any seals that you have behind the screen at the current value. Now you're only going to get that during the game by playing a pennant or waiting till the end of the game to sell them off and by then the prices may have changed to a point where they're not favourable for you anymore. So players will play these throughout the game fairly frequently actually. Um, you know, Every couple of turns you kind of want to be playing one of these to get yourself some new workers and sell off um, seals. Uh, and, and, and so they're, they're quite a nice feature of the game. They look great hanging on the edge of the player screens but we do get ourselves into situations like this where you're reaching over to get to the board and the whole thing goes over and the, the things go everywhere and it all becomes a bit of a mess. So they're not the most functional things in the world, but I can't deny that they do look nice. We continue playing until the second level is complete. By this point, the board will be full of these other buildings and workers. And then we have one last turn where each player may have the opportunity to build up a little bit onto the third level of the castle. And so it goes up like this. Um, the game in whole takes about, well, if you allowed yourself an hour, you'd, you'd get through it. Um, the game looks beautiful. It's the sort of thing that people will come over to the table and go, oh, what are you playing? You know, that looks fantastic. Um, it, it is a very attractive game. Uh, so it has that going for it. But it, it, it feels like a, a game from a, a slightly earlier era. I'm, I'm not talking, you know, what, decades ago, but 10 years ago, there were a glut of these sort of games around uh, the, the, the Wolfgang Kramer titles that I was talking about, that Mask trilogy, um, this game. The, the, it, it, it feels like the sort of game which we're not seeing a lot of at the moment, like that trend has passed, but it's still a really quality title. I've enjoyed this game a lot. It's lived up to the expectations that I have for it, uh, and it's one that I've played uh, quite frequently since acquiring a copy of it. It's a game that is out of print. It's it's not difficult to get. It comes up a lot in trades um, for some reason. I don't know why people seem to want to be getting rid of it, but uh, but but that's how I ended up with my copy. Um, but it's not you know uh, readily available on the market at the moment in the UK at least. Um, I like the game. It's got, it hasn't got a, a whole load of luck in it. Uh, there is, um, 
Well, no, there's, there's not even luck in, the, in terms of the card draw that's available for you. The game has a kind of ticket-to-ride type element to it, where there's a series of cards laid out, and you can choose to either take one of those cards or take a card blind off the top of the deck. And it's those cards which are going to dictate which buildings you can place in order to manipulate the prices in that market. That's the only element of luck. So it's a, a kind of a pure strategy game, really. Um, but it's light as well. It's easy to teach. There's not many rules to it. Um, so it's easy for people to pick up. And um, so it's, it's very accessible. And, and the fact that it looks so lovely helps with that as well. Um, I really enjoy games where you can speculate on prices um, and think, do I sell now or do I hold off and sell a little bit later? I enjoy that. You'll see there's a lot of speculation games on the shelves behind me, pure stock market-y type games. Um, this isn't to that level at all, but it's nice to have that feature in a game which is otherwise, as I say, essentially a, a spatial abstract um, with just a very thin layer of theme over the top of it. Um, that castle gives a nice... Um, physical, tactile sort of representation of those changing prices as well. Uh, and, and it looks really nice. Um, so, all in all, I would say this is a, a fantastic game if you like that sort of spatial reasoning, if you like a little bit of speculation, um, if, you, if you like that sort of... That, 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 the sort of game where a player can, another player can inadvertently ruin your plans or can, can have a think about you know, they've got some idea of what you're working on, they've seen the sort of seals that you're picking up throughout the game, maybe there's too much going on for them to completely keep track of it, but 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 they've got an idea of what you've got, so, so they know that they can either try and get in on that, because you're going to be increasing the prices of a certain commodity, so they want to get in on that too, or they can try and reduce the price of that commodity, um, so that it, it, it harms you, uh, and, and perhaps that will benefit them in another way. Um, so it's got elements of that. So if you like that sort of aspect, then then this is going to appeal to you. The the, the nice Tetrisy type pieces are similar to the pieces that you see in Princes of Florence. Um, so if you enjoy that aspect of that game, then uh, then you might enjoy this game too. So all in all, a quality game, one that I'm well worth pick, uh, well pleased that I picked up and well worth you trying to find a copy of. Uh, I shouldn't think it's too hard to come by, but you're probably going to get it second hand rather than buying it off the shelf. Okay, so that's Die Baumeister von Arcadia by Rudiger Dorn.